Welcome. Good afternoon. We are so glad that you're joining us here for this production seminar. And look at these amazing people that have joined us. Uh, we're very, very excited. This is the magic makers, the people who make the magic happen here at USF. And we're going to be speaking to them. I first of all want to thank the amazing people who make this possible, which is our sponsors. We are sponsored by Cedar City Brian Head Tourism Bureau. And we want you to come down our canyons and our valley and our city would love to see you down here. So we're grateful for their support. Uh, Richard, who are these wonderful people who make this magic happen here? Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, this is the production team, the full-time staff here at the festival. Um, I'm Richard Gertain. I'm the production manager. Uh, my, my job is to help facilitate the work that all these folks do. Uh, I have the pleasure of working with them all the time to talk about how we're going to implement the season, the designs that our talented designers and directors come up with. Um, before we get too far along, I want to make sure we go around and introduce everyone. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself uh, as the production manager, I've been here on site, I don't know, it's now six weeks maybe. Um, so I'm new, uh, new old, I guess. Uh, I was also a master carpenter and a assistant scenery supervisor and a scenery director about 12 years ago and uh, have come back here to rejoin these great folks. Um, so yeah, if everybody can go around real quick here and introduce themselves, uh, uh, that would be great. Dan, tell us about yourself. Uh, I am Dan Hedman. Uh, I am the scenery director. Um, I have been here since on site April 14th, maybe. So, and a little older than Richard is because I started in 97 uh, in scenery in the Adams as a master carpenter for a couple of years, then I was an assistant uh, technical director for a couple of years, and then I fell in with props for another 12 seasons out of, um, so 16 seasons out of 22 years, I think. Um, and yeah, that's where I am. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, Jeff, tell us about yourself. I'm Jeff Leader. I'm the costume director, and uh, my history here has been long. I started here 35 seasons ago. Uh, I was flying back and forth between Milwaukee and Cedar City for years and I recently retired from uh, the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee a year and a half ago and I'm here in Cedar City full-time now. Great, thank you. Marielle. Hi, Marielle Deneau. I'm the Assistant Properties Director. I have worked here for 23 seasons since 1998. Um, I, I was a crew head, I ran shows, I've been an artisan, and then I am now this here with that guy over there with the monkeys behind him. Um, so are we talking about what we do now or just who we are? Just who you are. We'll come, well, we can come back. Let's yeah. see what <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Scott Palferman, tell us about yourself. I'm Scott. I'm the electrics director. I have no idea how long I've been here. 27 years. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, ben, tell us about yourself. Uh, ben Homan, I'm the properties director. Uh, been here for 27 years, the same as Scott. I uh, started in 94. I've been on run crew, crew head, prop artisan, prop master, uh, props director, and twice interim production manager. Excellent. Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle. I'm the assistant electrics director, so I work with Scott all the time. Um, I've been here four seasons now and came on full-time 2019, so I've been here for a year full-time. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, so some of us you've already seen, hopefully, if you've joined us in our uh, previous <laughs> production seminars, maybe you've seen uh, Dan or Ben, uh, but I just I want to give a little snapshot of what each of you do. I, some of the positions are unique to USF. Some are a little, uh, you know, are things you might see throughout the industry, but just if you can give me a little snapshot of what your job is like, tell us sort of what you do to facilitate the productions and maybe a little bit how your job changes from say, when we are producing full-time in the summer to the time leading up to that. Uh, all those other months, how do we keep busy? Um, let's start with Ben. Ben, can you tell us about yourself? Yeah, so the props director oversees the props department. So there's a couple of prop masters and I prop master as well. 
So we oversee all of the, the prop stuff. So everything that's not a wall, floor, ceiling, or staircase on stage, it's visual. Actors might touch it, furniture, those kinds of things. We coordinate with designers to get all of that stuff, get it all on stage, um, make sure it all fits the theme and the look of the show. Um, and that's what we do six months out of the year for the season. The rest of the year, we're working on educational tour, playmakers, uh, organizing our warehouse of stuff, uh, cleaning our shop, hiring uh, staff for the next year, things like that. Excellent. Uh, Marielle, why don't you uh, follow up there and, and, and tell how, how, those two how these two jobs work together. What's your job about? Um, I do a lot of the, I, my job for a long time was called the acquisition manager because I acquire things either with money or with my hands. Um, so I do a lot of research and buying and paperwork and stuff on the computer, but I also take things to and from rehearsal. I do a lot of the pulling things from stock and getting them to whoever needs them, bringing stuff back and forth, supplies for the artisans to build things, things like that. And then in the fall, when we have fewer artisans or none, um, Ben and I will build shows. And then in the off season, we do a lot of maintenance and inventory and just upkeep and stuff like that. So I do a lot of things with the computer, but then I also do a lot of running around town. So. If you live in Cedar City, you probably have seen me at a store buying something and holding up the line trying to teach people how to do factories up. <laughs> Excellent, thanks. Uh, Jeff, tell us, tell us about your job. Well, as costume director, I'm responsible for hiring the staff and I'm in the shop all alone right now, but normally there's 55 or 60 people working and uh, uh, they come from all over the country to work at the festival. I recruit and hire them and uh, and then during the winter, during the winter and spring, I'm working with designers for acquisitions, for uh, uh, supplies and, and uh, materials needed, and uh, of course budgeting. Um, during the season, uh, it's mostly uh, we schedule fittings, we uh, we organize uh, the work crews, and make sure that everybody has the things they need to get the work done. I also supervise the wardrobe crew, which numbers, oh, 12 to 15 or 16 people <laughs> in the three different theaters and uh, make sure that they uh, stay on track and uh, are able to have the materials and supplies they needed, need to get their job done. Excellent, thanks. Uh, Dan, tell us about scenery uh, direction. The scenery director position, <laughs> it's, we're all doing about the same thing. Um, I have two technical directors. Typically in a season, I'll have two technical directors uh, working under me, specific to the spaces. My job is more of the managerial and the coordination. So it's how do you keep all of these balls that you've thrown in the air, and these balls are people and projects and everything else, how do you keep that streamlined? Um, our job is a lot is keeping the lines of communication open, uh, especially the, uh, across departments. So if there's, it's funny if they put a wall, a sconce on a wall, so the little light fixture on a wall, that touches my department, Ben's department, and Scott's, because Scott wires it, Ben, ben finds it, and we mount it, or we have to drill the hole in the wall so props can mount it, or vice versa. So it's a lot of the coordination stuff. Um, in a typical year, I don't know. I don't know what a typical year is. Um, COVID has been incredibly kind to me because it's given me a chance to learn the job. It's also given me a chance to do more uh, stock related things. So I, you can build dealing with hardware and things like that. It's actually given a lot of time that we don't normally have to take care of the little things because nothing really stops. As soon as the season is going, we're planning next year or we're planning education tour, the tour and playmakers, which happen in January and March. So it doesn't really stop, I think. I don't know, that's what I'm told. <laughs> that's what we're told, yeah, exactly. Um, Mr. Palferman, can you tell us a little bit about electrics and what does is, what is all that encompass? Electrics encompasses lighting, audio, video, atmospherics, and then the networking of our uh, entertainment systems. Uh, we coordinate with the designers to make their, what they envision in their head a reality. Uh, and then during the uh, non-repertory season, we do all the shows that Ben had mentioned, as well as a lot of maintenance and firmware updates. Great. Danielle, how did your job interface with all that? 
Uh, I basically help Scott out with all the maintenance, making sure everything is up to date, make sure everything is running. And then during the season, I kind of head up like daily small projects so that Scott can concentrate on big picture things and do all the meetings and things that happen. Um, and then I also am kind of like Marielle and do all the acquisitions and purchasing for our department. So everybody has what they need to do their projects and keep moving forward. Right. Yeah, a, a lot of a lot of what these folks do uh, is is based around facilitating the large group of seasonal staff that we bring in every summer who we're missing desperately right now. Um, but they they are constantly working and constantly busy trying to get things put together so that in that short period of time when we're working uh, on the the actors are here and we're rehearsing, everyone's here. We're able to use every bit of that time effectively. So each one of these people is busy all year long, making sure all that stuff is ready to go. Um, this, the next question I have for you is, is about sort of how you came to theater. Um, I think it might be surprising the path that some of you take, you know, uh, many of us come to theater in different ways, but I'd love to throw it out to a couple of you. What, what sort of brought you into theater? What was the first, what was the first job you had or position you had in theater? And then, um, you know, what, what drew you to it and kept, kept you working on it, made it a career? Um, Let's go to let's go to Ben. Um, I was being babysat by my older sister uh, when I was uh, probably 12, 11 or 12. And a friend of hers was in a show at the community theater. Um, and so she made me go along and they were doing the best little whorehouse in Texas. Um, probably not the most appropriate thing for a 12 year old to watch. But um, I just loved the theatricality of it. Um, and so I started volunteering at the community theater. I acted in a couple of shows. They actually uh, had old Carborock movie projectors. And on weekends, we didn't do shows. We ran old movies. So I ran the movie projectors, ran the concession stand, started uh, acting, working backstage. Thought I wanted to become a scenic designer. So I went to college for scenic design. Um, and after a semester, realized that uh, I wanted to actually do more of the building. So I got a degree in technical direction, which is more scenery stuff, because they didn't have a props program, but did a lot of prop work there. Um, and started working here before I graduated from, from college. Um, so sort of fell into props kind of sideways um, from, from scenery construction. Great. Um, Danielle, same question. Tell me, tell me how, uh, how, how did you get into this? Um, I was super involved in activities in middle school and high school, after school activities, and one day walked into our cafetorium in junior high school and they were doing a play and I was like, oh, that's super cool. And I wandered over to the tech table and just kind of sat down and they started handing me stuff to play with and I kind of took it from there and didn't really kind of volunteer in any one place until I decided this is what I want to do. Went to college for it, uh, thought I wanted to be a designer did that for about a semester and was like, nah, nah, not for me. Um, so I started uh, doing as much technician work as possible, thought I wanted to be a carpenter for a while, then fell into lighting and sound and was like, oh, this is where I belong. Um, and have been doing that ever since. Awesome. Um, does anybody else have a story where they, they sort of started out? I know, Dan, you might be a good person here, or even Marielle, started out in one discipline, have now found yourself in a different discipline, and and sort of how did how else, how did that transition happen for you? What kind of moved you from one place to another? Um, Marielle, do you do you, why don't you why don't you jump in on that? Because I know you've been a carpenter before, maybe. Yeah. Um, I well, as as a theater professional, I started um, working in props, and then there was a recession, and we had to cut production departments and stuff like that. So I lost my job in props, but there opened up a job in the same company in the scenery department. And you know, you can build things, you can build things. So I moved over and started building scenery and I was in scenery for a while. Um, and I was the master carpenter there at the Dallas Theater Center. And just, you know, it's, it, you're just building bigger things with different tools, but it's, it's very similar. So you kind of do that for a while. And then um, I've been coming out here in the summer. So I had a little bit of my prop vacation so I could come do prop stuff and build scenery so it kind of worked. I think if I only ever built scenery forever that I wouldn't like that because <laughs> props to me is a little more interesting because you do more variety. I mean there's a lot of variety in carpentry um, but 
there's more variety in props because we end up doing craft stuff and more soft goods and things like that as well. So um, since I've been doing props here, coming out here to do props full time worked out really well, but I can carpent if need to be, but I've done a little both. Got it. Dan, did you have anything to add to that or? Uh, well, my train has always been more jack all trades. Um, I was really lucky that I, when I got to undergrad, I already had an associates, so I didn't have to take gen eds, general education courses. So I literally took four years of theater and art classes um, and did every job in a show once. So I was a master electrician once, I worked backstage once, I was a master carpenter, uh, and then within two years I was designing and I designed every aspect, so lighting, sound, costumes, scenery. Um, so that was kind of incredible. And then when I got into technical direction, which was from the carpentry side, all of that just helped. You become, I've always felt to be a really, to be a good technical director, you have to have a knowledge of everything, including acting. And I did that a lot in undergrad and grad school because you have to know why they need this, you know, when an actor touches something, why, what it, beyond the motivation of, I can't remember what my line is, what, what helps more? I need this light here. You know, it, it's even with the, the uh, lighting backstage, the blue lights, I need this here because they're gonna come flying through here. They need to be able to see a little bit. So that was incredibly helpful for me. Excellent. Thanks. Um, building props. <laughs> Um, th this, this next question shifts gears a little bit and, um, you know, there are a lot of people out there probably who are maybe educators or are interested in the professions that you all, uh, have, have made your life's work. And, um, I'm going to throw this one out there to you, Jeff, and, uh, see how you feel. Um, why should someone go into theater production? What about these kinds of jobs, um, that we all do here? Uh, do you think, what kind of person would, would find them interesting? What kinds of things about it have you found fulfilling in your long career? Um, can you comment on that a little bit? Well, like some of the others, I started out thinking I was going to be a designer. Uh, I went to undergraduate school and then graduate school studying design, but I always liked the making part. Uh, and I realized that there's one designer for a show and there's a dozen or more technicians, maybe 15 or 20. And so the the idea of working uh, appealed to me, and uh, and uh, I I also find the idea of creating something from from a sketch to a three dimensional object really fulfilling. My dad was a great craftsperson, and you know I was always holding lumber and and handing him screws when he was building things, and so I learned from a really early age the joy of kind of making things, and um, uh, so I think it can be really fulfilling if you if you like making things. What I what I don't like now is the fact that I'm mostly an administrator paying attention to calendars and contracts and Excel spreadsheets and and I I'm I'm opening the doors and turning on the lights for everybody else to make things and I'm not getting to do that as much. But um, but if you enjoy making things, it can be a really fulfilling and satisfying thing. The other part of working in the theater that I think is important and and really satisfying to me is that we get to tell stories, uh, sometimes stories of other people, of other places, of other lands, of other times. And sometimes those stories can have a huge impact on, on today and can make a big difference in, in the audience's lives and, and change perceptions and, uh, and change minds about things. And I, I love the, the, um, the kind of subversive storytelling uh, aspect of some, some theater. Great. Thank you. Um, Scott, can you, can you comment a little bit on why, why you do this? What, what brought you to being an electrics director and to lights and sound and video and all that? Uh, I like the technology side of it, uh, the challenge of it, and then kind of along with what Jeff had said, the collaboration and creating something from research or drawing to a reality. You said you said the magic word for many of us theater folk, collaboration. It's can one I of our it's one of Can I add one thing, Richard? Well the yeah. one thing is that I, I should say that 
I was studying when I was young, really young, at the museum school in Toledo to become a painter or an artist of some kind. And I realized in junior high and high school, after all this work, you know, in in painting, that I hadn't didn't have enough ideas to be a painter or a solitary artist. And I found the collaboration that I could work with everybody else to create something that was so much better than what I was able to create by myself. You can share the joy, you can share the responsibility, you can share the glory. You also can share the blame if it doesn't really turn out. But, um, <laughs> but, it, but it, the collaborative part is critical to my uh, soul. And if people like to work with other people and create something that's bigger than they could ever do themselves, this is the place to do it. That's great. And that's exactly the thing I was gonna talk about here is, is we, the difference in many ways to theater as an art versus some of the other arts that we, that we take from, that we utilize skills from is collaboration. Is, the, is we, are, we are a collection of artists creating a piece and it, our, our interaction with the team members here within production, outside, inside of our design teams and our directors, those, that community of artists that comes together to create a piece of work that we, uh, that we put forward is it's vital to what makes us unique and it's vital to how it works or doesn't. Um, can we talk a little bit about how we collaborate first? Let, let's talk about how we collaborate a little bit with what we would call the design or artist, the, the directors, the, the people that come up with the ideas. Um, what sort of, what sort of process goes on between you as the production department head kind of where do you end or cross over those individuals? Um, how, how do those two groups of people come together? Um, ben, can you, can you start us off with that a little bit? How do you collaborate with the designers and directors? Sure, so uh, we will have production meetings uh, where the designer and director will sort of toss out their ideas, show sketches, things like that. And then our job is to look at those ideas, those renderings, um, the research that the designers may put in there um, and, and use our knowledge of how the festival works, our stock resources, um, what we may have in storage, things like that, to do the best we can to fulfill sort of that vision or dream that the director and designer have. Um, we have limited resources, uh, time, money, uh, um, et cetera, and, uh, and we have to sort of figure out the best way to create as much of that vision on stage for each show as we can um, knowing those resources and balancing them uh, throughout the, the season and the multiple shows. Great. So is that, can anybody talk, is there anything different or unique about your discipline? Say, Scott or Danielle, is there anything that, that's different about how lighting or sound, or, or is it very similar in the way you, were, in the way you uh, interact? <laughs> yes, yeah, Scott, Colin, it's all, it's all you, buddy. <laughs> Not so much. Uh, I, the, the process is very similar to what Ben said. Um, the, the only thing that's really different for our discipline is you don't see any of the things that we do necessarily. Um, so a lot of our discussions are actually negotiations between the other departments for space in the offstage areas and things like that um, so that we can actually create the environments with the light and the sound um, that nobody else would know is there unless it, it wasn't there, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's there's a lot of collaboration again that happens uh, once some of the ideas come come out. Here's the way. Here's what we want, but how are we going to make that happen? And I think uh, the way that lighting, like Dan described, with let's say it's a chandelier or something, how so many different people and so many different departments have to touch it. It, it's it's kind of like putting a house together where the electricians or the HVAC people come in after the sticks are put up and then the interior designer comes in and, and you know, decides where rugs and pictures and things are happening. So can we talk a little bit about how you approach um, once a designer or director comes up with an idea and if you have any like, ooh, this was one that we really needed to, to figure out, it'd be great to have an example. Um, how, how you collaborate amongst one another and, and how you come up with a solution. Jeff, you had, a, you had an idea? I just, I, I just wanted to say that, that one thing that people might not realize is that, that each of us, as well as the designer, the actor, the director, everybody has to have a deep understanding of the script and of the director's kind of interpretation or perspective on the script. And we can help that, that 
vision come to light, even if it's not carefully articulated and uh, are clearly articulated. Uh, and sometimes the, the, the surprising part is that the collaboration continues after the drawings are done, after the floor plans are drawn, after the sketches or costumes are finished, the collaboration continues right up until sometimes opening night. And all of the artists and artisans that are involved in the process are contributors. And in this organization at the festival and many of the other places I've worked, uh, that contribution is really valued and respected. The, the carpenter may, may say, you know, if we did it this way, or if you put it here, it might have this effect, which supports the vision even more clearly. Or the, the draper, the person who's making the patterns for the costumes, uh, says, if we did this or tried this, how about that? And uh, so that collaboration is, there is a, there's a hierarchy, of course, but the, um, the collaboration continues through the hierarchy. That's a great point. And I think that goes back to the idea of, you know, this is a community of artists um, putting something together. And each, along the way, each person, each artist, each artisan that touches the work actually contributes to the final piece that you see on stage. It's, it may, you know, our captain of our ship may be the director or in a discipline, it may be a scenic designer or a costume designer, but every single person that works alongside uh, of that design or through that process ultimately comes to, uh, you know, what we see on stage. I mean, we talked about it a little bit in our last uh, seminar um, discussing with the dramaturgs and we talked about how in, when a new play uh, development, the actors that are a part of that actually help mold what that final script comes to be. And I think it's the same way with any production that is put together. You know, maybe the thousandth production of Pericles we, that has been produced. I have, I have no idea how many, but every single one of them is unique because the artists, artisans, um, the company that does it, the times that it's done, and all those things affect what that piece of art is. Um, and each of these people are, are, are part of sort of are part of sculpting that. It, it's a, it, it is not the same without all of the different perspectives and talents and experience of those people. Um, thank you all for that, the, that great input. Um, I guess I just want to say, and, and Michael, I'll go ahead and shout out that we, um, we're starting to get a few questions here from Facebook. And if anybody has some questions for these individuals, uh, please go ahead and put those on Facebook and we'll, uh, we'll try to answer those uh, here in about 10 minutes. Um, but we got we'll have a couple more things we're going to touch base on here before we we hit those. Um, I want to talk a little bit about training and sort of going into this business. I, I you know we we talked uh, for a short time about you know how you came to this, why you're doing this work. Um, I'm interested what you think is a is a good process or a good um, good resources to go to. Um, if you're interested in more of this information, both from, let's say, you're somebody who wants to make a career out of this, you know, I want to be a carpenter, eventually a TD, I want to be uh, a draper, maybe I want to be a costume shop manager, um, or I'm an educator and I have these, I have to do all, I have to do a little bit of these things, or, or as a good collaborator, I should know a little bit about all the artists that I work with. So um, if you can, that's a big, that's a big gamut of things, but a little bit about training or finding information. Um, Mariel, do you have some thoughts on that that you want to you want to throw at us? No, maybe not. <laughs> uh, I mean, a lot of it is trying stuff, learning different. I mean, don't if you if you like theater but you don't really know what you want to do necessarily, you know, try a little bit of this. Learn to sew. Learn to use some power tools. Learn about electricity, kind of things like that. You know, go to whatever resources you have. Like if your high school has a program talk to people there and learn different parts of it. Um, as Dan points out, it is also good to know, like understand where the actors and directors and things are coming from. Not for me so much, but some people like that. Um, luckily, I never had to take an acting class. Ooh, so cool. um, but you know, kind of like what you need to learn different aspects. If you, if you're, you know, oh, I love working with this. If you love working with fabric, then um start building start making your own clothes start you know do try things watch videos on youtube talk to people that do it in the world or you know there's technology is amazing there's so much stuff online right now you can learn all kinds of things so you just kind of have to look and find things um these other guys will have some more ideas about like 
physical resources, but that's my spiel. Excellent. Oh, um, <laughs> Dan, how, what's your thoughts? Um, in an educational perspective, um, I just recently, I left a position where I, it's a, was a bachelor's program, so it's not a BFA, so it's, um, and it was much more of a generalist program. So like Mariel said, you, you learn a bit of electrics, you're, you're exposed to much more things. Um, I certainly recommend that track because you can always focus more in grad school. You know, if you want to be a technical director, it's better to learn all of the aspects than only hit that track. Um, I'm pretty much against the single track mentality because everything affects everything else. That's one of the great things about theater is everything I do affects and interacts with someone else's job. Um, you know, whether that's what you're building, how the doors work, how doesn't matter where we create scenery does like Ben said we do the we do the walls and the floors that give everyone else somewhere to play you know we allow you know it, it sets the it sets the base for everything else um, and that you have to have an understanding of every other aspect it's just you just can't live in a bubble it, sorry so box woo <laughs> Sorry. That's good. I was a teacher for a long time. <laughs> uh, Jeff, do you have any other thoughts about training or having been a teacher for? Well, I was a, a college professor for 30 some years and uh, the, the whole training aspect changed. Well, when I was went to school, there were colleges back then and, um, and the, the training was primarily designers. What's happened over the over the last 35 or 40 years is that there have been technology programs developing because people have realized that artisans are, are valuable to the industry as well. Um, but, but going back to the beginning, if, if you're in junior high or high school, I, I think see as much theater as you can. Uh, learn to discern the difference between whether, you know, if they're telling the story and, and how they're doing it and uh, if they're doing it effectively or how, what you would do differently. Um, see a lot of, of theater. Also go to museums, read books, read novels, uh, begin to develop a historical uh, um, foundation and an artistic foundation for all the work that you might want to do later. Um, you, you have to be well-rounded and you have to be uh, a liberal artist to be a theater artist, I think, and, and have an, a, a viewpoint, an, an understanding of a lot of different viewpoints. Um, also, if you, you know, the luxury of this all is, is crazy because it takes a lot of training, takes a lot of experience that's almost volunteer level. A lot of internships are, are poorly paid and are, are expect, you know, complete dedication. Um, uh, and so it's hard these days to find the support for that sometimes, but, um, but it, it's still a kind of a critical part of the, of the process. So if you can find, if you can volunteer at a, community theater or at a, a college that's that will take a, an intern or a, or a volunteer um, convince them that you're you have some skills to you that you, they can utilize and and be in the middle of it and you might like it and you might find another avenue too like Marielle said you might find you're better suited for this or that yeah um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, say hello to one of our very important members of production um, Thank you. Hello, Turtle. <laughs> Our cat. <laughs> turtle, uh, uh, Turtle, you may have seen in making an appearance in the prop seminar as well. So she likes to say hello. Um, thank you all. Uh, the, that's great. I, I do want to, I, this question is, uh, this is a loaded question. So, um, you know, <laughs> I'll let somebody volunteer. I won't, I won't uh, pick you out on this one, but, um, what do we think, uh, what do you think the greatest uh, misconception about artisans and technicians might be? What, what have you heard or experienced that you're like, uh, that's, that's just, that's not who we are. This is, we're, we're, we're more this part of the, the team. Uh, anybody got any thoughts, feelings? I, I think the, the biggest misconception when I do my seminar is people don't realize how much we actually create in every department. They think there are secret resources where Jeff can go and buy period costumes 
or there's a secret aisle at Home Depot where we can go and buy, you know, 18th century molding that they can't get their hands on or whatever. And the fact that we actually, we get artists uh, from all over the country, sometimes even outside of the country to come here and create all these individual pieces and then put them together into larger items, costumes or props or whatever. And then those go onto stage to make this, this whole piece of art that is a, a theatrical experience. Um, people just don't realize how much of that is actually created here at the festival for every single season. Well, and another part of it too, Ben, is that they think that sometimes people think that it's haphazard or, or not carefully planned and, and all, everything, every choice that's made is usually evaluated, reevaluated, discussed and rediscussed to make sure that it's the right decision, the right color, the right shape, the right texture, the right sound um, to reinforce the story. And our our goal is always the story. The script is is the most important part of what we do. And that literature, especially at a place like this where the the the, the, the theatrical literature that we're using is is important, um, we uh, we always go back to that. And every decision that we make is really uh, really carefully investigated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Sitting in a three hour blood meeting, you get out of that and you're like, was that, was that really important for 20 of us to sit there for three hours and discuss blood? But the decisions that are made and the final outcome, when you see it on stage, you're like, yeah, we made the right decisions and it took all of us that long to come to those things. So yeah. Or when a, when a prop has to come out of a pocket, you know, uh, I mean, that's a collaboration. It's like that pocket has to be crafted in just the right way so that they can do it effortlessly even if it might look like ever, but the same way every single performance. We don't have the luxury of, of a second take or, or doing it again. Um, I remember us working on matches for a long time, Ben, when yeah. a match had to be struck. It's like, that's not a simple project. <laughs> yeah. To make it reliable. Not yep. after right. Uh, great answers, thank you. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna go ahead and switch over and try to answer some of these questions from our followers on Facebook. Um, Liz, who's our second grade teacher, who's been with us through many, many of these, uh, maybe all of them. Uh, we're so thankful. <laughs> thanks for keep. Thanks for listening, Liz. Um, this one's for Jeff. Um, do you use costumes again and again? Remake completely? Save for later use? Um, I make costumes for my, my second graders that have to last a few years, so I try to make things too big but easily adjustable for sizes. Do you have any suggestions that might help? Um, we do use things, oh, it just disappeared. We do use things over and over and over. Um, we build them for strength and durability and probably a way that you might not need to for the second graders, but, but oftentimes things that look delicate or, or a dress that looks like it might kind of blow off if the wind were the right direction is structured in a way that it's 100% reliable. So we, we do build things. We, we have a big stock, a warehouse north of town that, that we keep things categorized and we reuse things. Um, we reuse, reuse them in ways that people might not recognize. Something from um, Henry VIII might show up in Richard III, but it might be repainted, reworked, retrimmed. So you probably wouldn't recognize unless you've got a really keen eye. Um, we can't afford to build everything from scratch and, uh, and discard it at the end of the season. One of the Years and years and years ago, one of my only arguments that I had with dear Fred Adams was he would tell people that we never reused a single costume. And I spent two years trying to convince him that saying that gave the wrong impression to our patrons, especially our patrons who were donating money. Uh, I, I said, Fred, if, if, they, if you convince them to believe that, then they will probably think that we're wasteful and foolish. If we we were to burn the par costumes in the parking lot at the end of the season and start over from scratch. It's not a good stewardship of our money. And I said, I said, please let's look at saying that in a different way. Um, and, and that was one of the, I just, you know, I've been thinking about Fred a lot lately. And of course, and, and, uh, and that was one of the only real arguments that I had with him over the years. So we reuse things that over and over, they're valuable things like petticoats and, and shoes, if they have good wear in them and, and armor and some tights and, and Things like that are reused frequently. Um, but we do make sure that everything works exactly as it needs to for the show. And if it needs to be custom built or, or uh, altered seriously, we'll, we have the time and the resources and the energy to do that. 
Um, as far as making costumes that fit a whole range of second graders, are, aren't they all mostly about the same size? I guess they, they vary in height and shape. But um, I would make them, you know, wrap around, tie, elastic, um, and keep them simple. Make them something they could wear over their own sweatshirt and jeans, and a, a tabard, a cape, a, a, a skirt can fit over a variety of things and, and be really useful. Um, you can contact me offline, Liz, if you have any other questions. My email address is at the festival website. Excellent, thank you. Um, this is this is a this is a good one. I'm I like this one a lot. This one's from Ivy. Uh, are there any surprising skills that you didn't know you needed in your career, but that have come in handy? Math. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yes. So take much. accounting classes. I regret that, but I never did. <laughs> Ergonometry. Geometry. Every day. Excellent. Scott, anything? Math and geometry. We do it every day. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Remember it's, that. It's, it's, it's amazing how much science is in what we all do. Yep. Whether it's dyeing fabric, whether it's the physics of getting something to roll or not roll when you want it to. Um, uh, yeah, it's science and math are so much a part of making the art work that it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I like to describe the work that we do in a lot of ways as we're constantly prototyping things. Um, rarely do we, I mean, it's all a modification of, of some practices, but a lot of it, like this one time we make this thing to do this one thing very, very well over and over again. Um, but we're all a little bit engineer, a little bit, uh, you know, project manager, a little bit, um, sometimes sociologists, depending on the relationships. I mean, there's so many things that go into it. Um, when I was in my, in my last job, I was a technical director and I had to do structural analysis, strength of materials. I mean, all these different things you were just like, I thought we were going to make, we we're going to make art. Well, art requires a lot of different skills. So for all you young children out there listening, if you think theater is just all fun and games. Um, Theme, not STEM. A lot of people talk about like, just building or doing and have ended up managing. And there aren't, I mean, like, we don't have management classes in our repertoire currently. And so it's a lot of learning on the job. So like, understanding how people work and how to manage people and that kind of thing goes a long way towards just being a better theater artisan in any way, shape, or form. Just knowing how to interact and have relationships with people because yeah, uh, Ben has said several times, he's like, I, now I'm in charge of people and I'm a manager and I've never been taught how to do this. You just kind of, you figure it out. And so that is something probably would be a good skill to have learned. I don't know if you can teach empathy or not, but empathy is a huge aspect of our work. Um, you know, and, and psychology as well. We, in the costume shop, not in the scene shop so much, or prop shop, but we ask people to come into a, a room and these actors come in and they're, they're struggling with all these different lines and all these different characters. And we ask them to come in here and put on somebody else's clothes and, and be comfortable in them. You know, we have to make sure that they become comfortable in them as they create the character. And so they may not like something or feel really strongly about something and it's our job to collaborate with them to continue that collaboration so that that costume those shoes that ring becomes a tool for them to help tell the story as well and um and it can be really vulnerable and really scary for an actor to come into a fitting uh and see when they haven't had a huge influence in what what they're going to look like we make alterations and adjustments all the time because we, it's a continual collaborative process. But you have to understand, if that's why it's good for everybody to become an actor at one time because you gotta know what that terror is like. Boy, oh boy, did I figure out I didn't wanna do that very quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this one, this is, a, this is sort of a, uh, this is a good one just to let people understand the volume of people that it takes to do this work. You know, Jeff sort of talked when he was first getting started, it was like, wow, there's a dozen people backstage for every person on stage. So um, some people might, might be surprised to know. Um, this one comes from Tanya. How many artisans does it take to put a USF season together? Wow. 
I should probably know this. <laughs> um, there's there's between uh, there's about twelve to fifteen in the props department. Sixty in costumes, another dozen in hair and makeup. Scenery and painting is probably anywhere anywhere between thirty and forty, depending on the season. And crew is uh, the run crew is so all the backstage is all could be another fifteen, sixteen. Electrics is right around 20. Okay. Stage management. Yep, so another 15 or so the there. Old, the old phrase used to be for every one person on stage, it was five to seven people behind the scene. Right. So for um, every single actor, if it's a cast of 30, there are more behind <laughs> it. Yeah, a whole bunch. So Matt. we listed off about 200 people there. Um, and then we think about all the front of house personnel, all our people in the education department, all of our other artistic support staff. There are, you know, for our 50 or 60 uh, actors that are part of the company, there's probably 300 or more individuals that are, that are working behind the scenes, off the stage to do the work, so. Uh, well, one of the great moments, we do a company meeting every, every year. And it used to be something that I think Fred Adams was, one of the main components of is that we would have everyone stay or what was it we, everyone would um we would have all the actors stand up they'd be a group they'd sit down all right all the technicians stand up so everyone else in the room it was usually <laughs> about if it, it was 25 percent performers and then 75 percent everyone else and that doesn't include any of the front of house because they don't start until we're in dress Great. Um, this one's from Mary. Uh, what is your favorite example of a collaborative effort come to fruition? Does anything cross department or script driven come to mind? Yes, Ben. I have several, but the first one that I thought of was the end of Book of Will a couple, uh, two years ago. Um, the, the sound, uh, lighting, the pages falling from the sky, which was a collaboration between props and scenery costume pieces I mean just everything like about that moment um, and it almost got cut like the pages hanging in the air almost got cut at one point and we all fought so hard because the director's vision was so clear and and that story was so much a part of what the festival is um, that um, that during tech uh, and every I went, saw, went back multiple times and saw it um, and every time I sort of teared up about it because we all fought so hard to to make sure that that vision in that moment occurred the way that it was in Melinda's mind because it was important to all of us um, uh, because it was about Shakespeare and, and creating his work and, and, and everything, which is what the festival is all about. Uh, just unbelievable the amount of effort that we all went through to make that happen and how amazing it turned out at the end. Thank yeah. you. Anybody else have anyone they want to share? Or? Top that, come on. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, there's nothing to top that one. That was of all the thir the hundreds of productions I've done at this festival and other places, it uh, it was the most effective storytelling and culmination of the show. Great, thank you. Um, Tracy asks, have any of you had to learn or run a crew show track at the last minute? <laughs> Probably all of us have. Yeah. The wardrobe crew. Um, when they're learning the figuring out the show and designing what they're doing backstage, because they're working on a script, a, a role as as carefully delineated as the as the actors are. They have to be in this place at that time with this stuff and know their lines in the same way. So they they do what we call swing cards. They're they're three by five cards that they write the action their action backstage and they number them and sequence them and by uh, final dress, opening night, they usually get those done. They, those are what we rely on if somebody's sick. We have, they leave them at the theater so that somebody could step in if somebody had to understudy a wardrobe person at the last minute. And I have had to fill in before using those swing cards and they are often so, de de so um, uh, detailed and, and uh, carefully written that it's easy to, to follow. You just wear them around your neck and flip them one after the other. Um, uh, it's a technique that we 
stole from Broadway shows when we were visiting backstage there years and years and years ago. And, and I thought, well, this is the smartest thing ever. Let's do this. And, um, and we've done it every year since. And because of the way we do it here, a lot of places, university theaters and other places have developed the same ideas uh, rather than sheets of paper, put them on cards. And so we can swing in if we have to swing and understudy a wardrobe person pretty easily. That's a really great point is that we think of understudies, I think, on stage all the time, but every single position, whether it's from stage management, backstage, running crews, there's, there are systems in place to try and make sure that that information uh, still exists and we can continue to run the shows uh, because people need to be able to get sick if things happen or, you know, we want to be prepared so that we can continue to have the show uh, happen. And whenever um, we don't plan for any, for every inevitability, we get caught. So all of us, there's a, there's a 200 years of experience here. We know better and we figured that out. We don't let it happen anymore. Yeah. Uh, I like to say, uh, you know, production people think about how to break things. Like we're, we're sort of uh, hardwired to be like, what's going to go wrong. Um, it's not pessimism. It's, uh, it's our, our way of being prepared. So I like, I, I like to think of that. Um, this is, this is a good one. Um, uh, from Michelle. Uh, can some of you give examples of productions you were a part of that did not go, in quotes, obvious, um, but use more cleverness and new avenues to get thematic, thematic ideas across? For example, maybe, in, maybe to try and get a somber moment or sad moment across, we didn't use dark lighting, we, you know, uh, or we didn't use uh, dark fabric to do the same thing. Any kind of really, really unique approach something that was you felt like was really different? I, I feel like a lot of times our, our education tours do that because we're trying to reach a high school audience and we don't want to be uh, too obvious. So um, we did a production of Midsummer a couple of years ago that uh, Britannia Howe directed um, and she wanted everything to be almost like a pop-up storybook kind of thing. Um, and that worked really well in, in the ways that we, but I think a lot of times there are so many layers to the shows that like when I do my seminar and I say, oh, the reason we did it this way is because the designer the, or director had this thematic idea they wanted to carry through with this prop. And the audience is like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Or like costumes, like we chose certain trims to delineate you know, levels of society, or like, you know, and like we designers and directors think about all this stuff. We spend so much time putting all these details in there and the audience, I mean, they get it subconsciously, but they don't actually realize why they're understanding it. And it's, it's so many layers of detail that they kind of goes over their heads. But when you tell them, you're like, oh, that makes so much sense. And like, oh my gosh, somebody thought of that. So uh, yeah, but I, I think we do it a lot. And it's not always obvious. A lot of the stuff, a lot of the work we do design-wise is, is works in a subconscious sort of way, I think. Sometimes it's obvious, the leading lady in a white dress, but, but sometimes it's really uh, subconscious and tying things together in ways that might not be too obvious. Um, one example I think that our summer patrons might remember is a production of Romeo and Juliet that we did out, outdoors across in the old theater. Uh, David Ivers directed it, and, and Juliet ended up dying in a red dress, I think. And Fred hated that idea. He yeah. wanted it to be more <laughs> traditional. And, um, and Bill Black, the costume designer, and David I Ivers, the director, fought for it and ultimately won. And I think it, it put a new take on the whole thing and, uh, and was effective, but it wasn't, it wasn't standard. It wasn't standard uh, traditional uh, garb for for the young leading lady in any means. Great. Yes, Dan. There's also things with design that that kind of the audience expects. So there's, and it's based on color or line or, so when you use the color blue, it could be night. Yellow is warm, red is hot, um, green is sick sometimes, you know, like, so a lot of those conventions we use both with and, exact and against. So you kind of fight that convention and sometimes that makes audiences uncomfortable, which you actually want. That is a, that can be a choice within the production of how, you know, with the direction or with the 
specific design, which is something that I don't know people normally look at. You know, that's why when you have, uh, I don't know if that, that question is gone, but, um, but that's something that we work with. That's some of the tools that designers and directors play with. You know, so you can you can create a happy scene. It's you know you dress them in yellow or the fur, you know the furniture's yellow. It, it audiences have a preconception when they come in and see things, so you have to either use that or or go against it to make up to make a statement, which is really interesting. Great, thank you. thank you. Well, and sound designers use instrumentation to create what they want and the type of instrumentation within their composition creates the overall mood that they're trying to set. As well as using instrumentation instead of like a sound effect is often happens as well. Excellent. Um, this one comes from Tanya. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about um, your work that in the non summertime? So design, uh, we spoke a little bit about education and how we work with the educational uh, tour and playmakers. Um, also development. What what other things does production get involved in besides, you know, just making shows? Um, what uh, what other things do you do? <laughs> Anybody? Uh, we do backstage tour, like special tours for people, um, showing them our warehouses, things like that. Um, we, um, we design the educational shows. We have to each do our own hiring for our departments for every season. Um, we, we do a design process that actually generally will start about a year in advance. We're actually working on designs for next year. So we have production meetings where we see designs we'll of additional meetings with the designers to narrow things down, um, prepping for build. Um, so it's, it's funny. We talk about on season and off season, but our jobs are really, they're as busy year round. They're just others. We're not, we're not producing shows on our main stages, but between all the educational programming that we, we produce and, and we design some of that in house. So we do the scene design and, and prop design and lighting design stuff for like the educational tour and playmakers and things like that within the full-time production staff. Um, so um, we're actually really busy the full year. Um, and we may get calls from development. Hey, we need to go up and do this event in Salt Lake. We need costumes or props or whatever. And so we're constantly doing that. We do rentals, all kinds of things. So lots of stuff, always. We're often uh, called upon to do special patron events for donors, um, workshops or lectures uh, uh, to give uh, donors a, a new insight. Um, and the other thing too has been and Dan, well, everybody, uh, equipment maintenance. Uh, lighting does equipment maintenance year round. We, I've been shuttling sewing machines to St. George and to Salt Lake City for repair. We don't have a repair service in town. And so we are shuttling stuff so that everything is in perfect working condition in uh, May when we start up. And well, hopefully perfect. And we just don't have a lot of extras. So if something goes down, it can be really critical to our timeline. Uh, so that equipment maintenance is is critical. And before I was here full time, I mean, in the old days, we we uh, we moved into the Southern Utah University costume shop, and we had to haul everything out and set it all up. Now we've got the shop set up, and so we can do a more uh, structured uh, and regular routine maintenance rather than just waiting until something some catastrophe occurs. Great. Um, I saved this question from uh, Andrea. And I think it, it's kind of apropos for, for the, coming to the end of our conversation. Um, how do you see the theater changing or not as a result of the pandemic? And I think we're all, in, I, I certainly know that's on my mind all the time and we talk about it constantly in a, uh, across the country with other production managers and, and how we're gonna approach what, what may be or what is likely. Um, but do any of you have some sort of personal insights about you know, what you're really thinking about or, or things that you see as changing or not? I, I think, I hope the, the work on stage doesn't change drastically, that we don't get all one person shows because they're easier to manage backstage and there's no costume changes and there's no props that it can't get dirty. I hope we find a way around all of that. And it's going to take some work of a lot of different departments and brains going together to figure this out. I don't want to film everything and put it on uh, film or TV or the internet. Those things exist. They're called movies and TV. We're a live event. So I, I want to find a way to get back to that. But I do hope we find ways like we're doing with this to be more engaged with our audience year round in the entire process. That uh, it's not just about showing up, buying a ticket, sitting in the theater and watching an event, but it's a much deeper and better understanding and appreciation of the entire 
entire process it takes to make that art happen. Um, and so there's, there's more appreciation that when you sit in that seat and you watch that final event, all of the steps and the processes that it took to get there. So I hope we build that into, into the new, the new uh, post COVID theater world, but I really hope we can get back. And, and our goal is next year to produce fully realized shows like we are used to with large cast and, and full production values and everything. And I hope that we can figure out a way to do that because that's, that's the heart of the art that we do is that every production that you come and see is different than the one that happened the night before because of the interaction between the audience and the actors. But also the same. But also the same, as my <laughs> wise wife says. The, um, uh, that part is critical. Uh, the interaction between the audience and the performance that happens live each night is 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 a critical part. And I I don't want to end my career not doing that. I'm I'm I have some concerns about it, but I I want to make sure that we can continue it. I also want to continue to go to theater and see it at other places as well. <laughs> Movies are great. TV is wonderful, but it's not the same. The engagement with the patrons and the audience is one of the things, the non, uh, the stuff that happens off the stage at the Utah Shakespeare Festival is, is remarkable. And, you know, uh, uh, the seminars, the tours, the, the interaction that we have with the patrons on the courtyard is, is one of the most important aspects of this place and what has drawn me back for all those years. Every place else I've worked, uh, Great Lakes, Cleveland, other places, Broadway even, it doesn't have that same interaction with the audience. Our patrons expect it, they, they, they desire it, and they, they enjoy it. And it helps their, uh, their appreciation of what we do. We can continue to, to broaden how we present it. But I think it's, a, it's something that's unique to this place from all the other places that I've worked. And I, I know we'll continue that. And uh, our patrons will appreciate it in whatever format it's delivered. Dan, yeah. yeah. One of the things that's more of a hope is that with COVID, I hope there is a greater understanding of how much the world needs the arts in general, not just in live theater in particular, because that's what we do. But as articles have said, what would COVID be? What would lockdown be without music, books, videos? movies. That's what all of us do, you know, all of our colleagues within the arts. And I mean, we've been told that theater, live theater is dying. They've been telling us that for 2000 years. <laughs> um, but to find a way to make it more important in a broader sense, you know, it's obviously important for us. I'm incredibly grateful to have a job right now. Um, but that means a lot of because we canceled a lot of folks don't but you know it's it's getting the regular people to understand how important this is to them and how much they need us as much as we need them that's excellent thank you dan um i i, I want to just make sure a quick shout out to tanya our festival stage manager who is uh running the show as it were so she's backstage with us right now um, feeding us questions, uh, and we're so thankful for her, and she's a big part of our group here, too. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. I turn it over to Michael. Any, any last thoughts? Uh, what a great group of people, right? Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, it's a blessing. Uh, we are so blessed to have giants in the industry like you see represented here. And you see their work on stage all the time, but to get them here in the room, I've seen them in the room. I've seen them, those, plus others debate about what the blood will work like, et cetera. And it's, that's, that's the magic, that collaboration. And uh, we are so so blessed uh, for what you've shared. So thank you so very, very much. I'll remind you all that next week, Thursday at 10 o'clock, we're going to be talking about uh, Taming of the Shrew and seeking relevance in our present time. Is it still relevant or not? We're going to have uh, two Kates that are going to kind of come and discuss that with us. And then on Friday at this same time, one o'clock, we're going to talk to Ben Holman and Dan Giedemann. They're going to talk about repertory magic. If you haven't had a chance to see that while you've actually been down here, we're going to do, uh, they're going to change the set over completely all there. No, we've, we've got some really cool things that are planned for that. So don't miss that as well. Conversation still continues online. You can continue with uh, Facebook. Uh, you can also find these on YouTube and we're grateful for your patronage now. Uh, thank you to Cedar City, Brian Head and Tourism Bureau 
Cedar City Brian Head Tourism Bureau. And uh, thank you so much.